to you in partnership with the wonderful folks at Hopkins and Carly. They are a Silicon Valley law firm with a history of working with technology startups across a variety of industries. We launched this series to give founders guidance on the startup journey, everything from I have an idea to what's my exit strategy and kind of everything in between that. Um, my name is Denise Cardozo and I am the executive director of Silicon Valley Forum. We are a 38 year old nonprofit supporting, educating and connecting the global startup and technology ecosystem. I wanna thank you all for joining us here today. And just a reminder that today's event is being recorded and everyone will remain muted throughout the duration of the program. However, we encourage you to ask your questions to our speaker throughout the talk by using the Q&A box located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We are really excited today to have award-winning publicist, Nicholas E. Adams as our speaker today, who will take us to school on our, your marketing and brand strategy. He is the president and CEO of Ninico Communications, working with some of the most storied brands in Silicon Valley, as well as across the US. Before we get started, I'm going to turn this over to our co-host, Brendan Lunn, who is a chair of corporate department at Hopkins and Carly. So Brendan. Hey, Denise, thanks so much. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. I'm seeing people from the UK and, and Austria and Colombia. That's pretty exciting. Um, as Denise said, my name is Brendan Lund. I'm a shareholder uh, and chair of Hopkins and Carly's corporate department. Um, our firm is really excited to participate uh, as a key partner in the Silicon Valley Forum Startup and Venture Capital Club series. Um, you know, and we've been doing this uh, for, for about six months uh, with uh, four, four or five, six months to go. Um, so th this has been a really good time that we've had uh, sponsoring this. And, and um, I want to take a moment to share um, some information about our firm and our corporate department. So Hopkins and Carly is a full service law firm. We have offices in San Jose, California and in Palo Alto. Um, so we're, we're focused on the Silicon Valley. We have about 70 plus attorneys um, geared towards working with startups, investors and established middle market businesses uh, through all phases of the business life cycle. Um, we have expertise in corporate finance mergers and acquisitions, intellectual property, tax, uh, corporate governments working with boards, um, branding and trademark. We also do real estate employment, business litigation, and then privacy and data security, something that, that um, all of our clients are interested in at this point in time. Basically, all of these services are what a, a startup venture needs. We also um, sort of are set apart from other big law firms in that we have, um, we, we cater to high net worth individuals. We have a family wealth um, department that uh, does estate planning needs for, for startup founders. I think our clients enjoy working with us and I know we enjoy working with our clients. Um, the Hopkins and Carly attorney focuses on understanding our clients' businesses uh, and operations, the technology behind it, um, so that we can provide practical, effective advice. Um, we're comprised of former big law attorneys. We streamline our staffing uh, with senior attorneys so that you're working with, um, our clients are working with a, a partner level person uh, and our, our hourly rates are, are lower than uh, a partner would be at a, at a big law firm. So um, we're re really excited to be participating in this. Um, thanks for giving me a moment to, to talk about our firm. And I wanna hand it either back to Denise or, or to Nicholas. Thanks so much, Brendan. And um, would you mind sharing your email maybe in the chat box? So if some of the startup founders out there would like to um, you know, reach out to you. Sure, no problem. Um, yeah, that would be great. And um, so thank you so much. All right, Nicholas, um, I'm gonna give you the floor now. You have such an impressive bio. I mean, certainly I could not get through it all, <laughs> but would love for you to kick things off, I could think by telling us a little bit more about your background and also the big announcement that you had just recently. So, Nicholas. Thanks, Denise. I appreciate it. And Brennan, thank you for allowing uh, this, this to actually happen today. Uh, you'll hear me talk throughout today's uh, event around the power of partnership. And uh, that is, that's evidenced here right now with the partnership of Hopkins and Carly 
supporting this event this morning. We can't do it without our partners and we don't. So I uh, tip my hat to you, Brendan, and, and the good folks at Hopkins and Carly. Um, thank you very much, uh, first of all, to, to Silicon Valley Forum for uh, inviting me to speak uh, this morning with all of you. I say this morning, uh, but as Brendan mentioned, we do have people uh, throughout the globe uh, watching us. So good afternoon, good evening, good night, wherever you are. Um, thanks for, for being with us today. Um, just a really quick, I will not read my bio because that, that's quite embarrassing, but a, a really quick background on who I am. Uh, then I'll get into uh, to our presentation, and I want to leave plenty of time at the end of our brief hour together today uh, for plenty of Q&A, or as I call it, conversation. Uh, so I am a publicist. Um, I like to think of myself as such, although my role has morphed uh, over, over the years. Um, publicists uh, are, are really tasked with promotion, publicity of brand, of business, of project, uh, or of idea. Uh, and, and so when most folks around the world think and hear the, of the word publicist, they think of Los Angeles and the entertainment world. Um, and while that is true, uh, publicists serve in many other capacities across healthcare and tech and real estate and automotive, and the list goes on. Um, I'm also a strategist and advisor, having assisted uh, many companies and brands and business leaders over uh, a decade uh, with Minico Communications, where I serve as CEO, uh, helping them think bigger and, and bolder um, about their brands, but also about their message to the world and, and to, to their audiences they serve. Uh, I'm very involved in the two communities that I float between, uh, both San Jose, the capital of Silicon Valley, uh, and Los Angeles. Uh, there is uh, Silicon Beach, as many of you know, in Santa Monica. And uh, if, if you're there from Santa Monica uh, and Silicon Beach, hello to you uh, from up north. I'll be joining you down in Santa Monica again uh, very soon. Um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the global economy in, in which we now live is really fascinating for tech. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well today. Uh, as we begin our partnership conversation. So with that, I'm gonna share my screen. I do have um, a slide deck just to keep me on task and conversation this morning, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll get into it here. Okay, I want to make sure everyone can see the screen and uh, we'll go through the, uh, the deck. So today's conversation, uh, SV Forum entitled Marketing and Brand Strategy, but we'll probably talk uh, about quite a bit more than just those two areas. We're going to talk about advertising. We'll certainly touch on digital conversation. Um, but before we get into any of that, I want to talk about getting your house in order. And uh, if, if you've run a company successfully uh, for as, as long as I have, you will understand that the five points on the screen in front of you are not only important to the success of your business, but without them, you can't succeed. These are foundational to any business, any size of business, and any industry. So I wanna make sure I hit these five really quickly. This is gonna tee up our conversation for, for the rest of our time together today. And these five um, ideas, these, uh, these nuggets of wisdom come from 10 years of coaching startup CEOs and founders. And I wanna pass this on to you so that as you begin your companies or are looking for your next round of funding or investment, um, that you ensure you are uh, checking the box on all five of these. I know these five in a unique way now, 
Uh, as a couple months ago, I joined a new venture capital fund called Driven Capital. And Driven is one of those first check-in type venture capital funds. It's created for entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs. And these five opportunities for engagement really come from meaningful conversation with the Driven folks as well. The first rule, and many of you know this, is check your ego at the door. I don't know how many startup CEOs and founders I've worked with over a decade who don't understand that uh, and to the detriment of their business, unfortunately. But the, the most important part of being a CEO, uh, being a, a president of a company or founder of a brand is being able uh, to, to surround yourself by people who are intelligent and then getting out of the way and allowing those folks to do what they need to do to support your vision, your brand, and ultimately your success. What happens when you don't do that? Uh, you, you ultimately, um, you, you don't succeed in the way you can, right? And so checking your ego at the door is really important. The second point is probably the most important point on this slide deck, getting your house in order. What do I mean by that? Power of partnership, never underestimate it. For those who are just starting your business, you're hearing this conversation today at the perfect time. For those who have begun their business uh, and are looking for some funding, uh, this is a critical time for you to get your house in order. So what do I mean by that? I mean, look at the folks who you don't have internally within your company and figure out how to support your vision and your brand in a strategic way. Your attorney, your financial advisor, your tax consultant, right? These are really important players and you wanna make sure that you're allowing yourself to be surrounded by them early enough. Know them before you need them, right? That's really important. So getting your house in order is, in, is a critical component. By the way, when you go to ask for funding, one of the first things that prospective angels or venture capital funds will ask is who are your partners before they ask for your cap table, before they ask for really much of anything else. They want to know who's working alongside you to help you and your brand become successful. So getting your house in order is of utmost importance. The third is trusting the process. And this is really hard for a lot of founders, but it's so important. There's something called founder's pride. Pride can really mess with you. So I put this note on here for, for our conversation here today to remind all of us that there is a method to the madness. And to simply say, hey, we're going to send these press releases out and it's going to attract investment is one of the craziest things that I as a publicist and strategist could ever hear from a founder or a CEO. Investors don't care about a press release that goes out unless there's meat and potatoes behind that press announcement, right? They don't care. They want to see action. But to see action, you as the founder must allow yourself to trust the process. So when a publicist or when a strategist or when your attorney comes to you and says, you know, we really should start with a marketing plan, or we really need to look at a crisis communications plan, or, you know, whatever it might be, please trust their process. They're here to help you, right? Uh, we can't create a, a presentation deck to go woo and attract investors uh, until you've put in the hard homework before that. The fourth point is know when to step aside. And this is the hardest conversation I've ever had with startup uh, CEOs and founders. You took it from maybe A to H and you did an excellent job. But to get it from H to Z, we need someone 
with different expertise. We need you as the founder to remain founder. You will always be founder of this brand, but it's time to bring in maybe a co-CEO or a co-president or someone else, not to replace you, but to help you. And that will ultimately help your brand awareness. That will ultimately help to attract new and vibrant investment and a whole host of other opportunities. And finally, listen and learn. When my book comes out next year entitled The Power of Partnership, I hope you'll, you'll pay special attention to the chapter in the book called Listen and Learn. If you're really interested in investing your time and your energy and your resources in growing your business, you have to be, as founder and CEO, able to sit at that boardroom table and listen and learn from others who have been in those shoes in the past. I know that because when I started my company, I did that. And when I didn't do it, I failed. And when I did it, I succeeded. So take it from someone who learned in some cases the hard way, um, but take it from someone who has been in your shoes as a founder uh, and if you're starting your company right now in this interesting economic time globally, go into it with zero expectations. Go into it thinking this could either be the next big thing for your industry, or it could be something to, to keep you going and learn something new. But when you go in with high expectations, you start to think differently. And the founder's pride gets in the way of meaningful conversations that could ultimately help attract investment and partnership opportunities. So uh, this was a really important slide for me to cover this morning before we get into now the fun conversation that we're going to have around brand, PR, and the digital space when it comes to advertising as well. I would encourage all of you to uh, include your questions I will take those questions at the end of our presentation, uh, but feel free as I go along here to uh, include those in uh, the Q&A box in our Zoom conversation here today. So brand is the first thing that we're gonna discuss today. And you know, when most people think of brand, they think of your little logo, they think of your identity. Uh, unfortunately, if you only think of brand in that way, you've already messed up. So here's a way to correct that. There are three key areas I wanna to cover today in our brand conversation. The first is brand promise. The second is brand messaging. And finally, the third is brand identity, which is the little logo above my head there, right? It is important. It is an important part of your brand. It, it is uh, very telling of who you are and how you ultimately message your business to others. But it is not where we begin. And if you begin there, you've already, uh, you're, you're already out of line with the, the first and the second. So we need to start at brand promise. Think of the greatest brands in the world and what comes to mind when you think of that brand? Coca-Cola, Walt Disney Company, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, uh, Heinz Ketchup, right? Just think of some really big companies Hershey's, right? And what do you think of when you hear that brand? Whatever you're thinking of right now in your head is directly connected, not to the identity of that brand, but to the promise of that brand. And you're thinking about that because that brand has done an excellent job of communicating through their brand messaging what their promise actually is. So don't forget, we start with promise, then we go to messaging, 
then we go to identity, right? That's the method to the madness that I covered when I was talking about getting your house in order. Founders will come to us and they'll ask, can you create a logo for us? And if they ask me to do that, nine out of 10 times, I will say no. And they look at me like, what? Don't you want my business? And I say, I would love to work with you, but the logo is not something that we will talk about for maybe even five months. There's a lot of work to do before we get to your identity, right? So the brand promise becomes something that you, uh, that you really rest everything else upon. It's the foundation upon which you build your brand and your, and your business. The, the two other parts of the promise that I want you to remember are people and projects. Regardless of industry, uh, let's assume for today's conversation, uh, you're in tech. Who are the people you're surrounding yourself with and by to increase your brand awareness and the success of your business? Whether that's a path to revenue, whether it's lead generation, uh, you know, whether it's capital investment from VC funds in Palo Alto, I don't care what it is, but it always goes back to people. And if you think it doesn't go back to people, you need to check yourself and your team on how you actually think of business. Investors don't invest in ideas alone. They, uh, they invest in ideas when they invest in people who can really communicate the vision of that brand, of that product, or of that service. So it really all goes back to, to people. Again, power of partnership, totally critical. And then projects, promise, people, projects. What are the projects that your brand will work in and of? Is it a, a built environment? Are you building a, a skyscraper in Miami? Uh, are you working on a new SaaS platform that will take um, you know, this new market by storm as we emerge from the pandemic? Uh, are you looking at becoming the Amazon of or the Uber of X, Y, or Z? What are the projects that your brand will ultimately become part of? And then how do you communicate those things, right? So all under the umbrella of that first brand piece of promise, those two subheaders, don't forget, people and projects. All right, let's move on to the second area of brand, message. We'll talk a little bit more about message in a minute when we get into PR. But message is an important piece of the brand bucket. It's, 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 a, it's a really important piece because now you know who you are in that brand promise category. Now, how do we take who you are and translate that to what you do and why you do it? That's the brand messaging component. That's that piece that is so important. So again, go back to the people you're surrounding yourself with and by, who's gonna help shape and craft that messaging? How does that messaging relate to a marketing communications plan that investors may want to see? How does that messaging relate back to a crisis communications plan that your insurance, that your attorney, that your angels might want to see, right? So all of these components that a lot of founders don't think about until it's too late, don't do that. Make sure you're doing the hard work in the beginning. So whether you're looking for seed funding or you're entering series B right now, press pause today and allow yourself to think differently so that you can become a bolder and a better brand. But these pieces are critical. So marketing communications plans are important because it becomes the Bible, the Holy Grail for your, for your brand. How do we check back to what's in that marketing communications plan? Well, here we are in the messaging component, right? Who are you? What do you do? And why do you do it? 
And the, the crisis communications plan I mentioned is really important as well. There are moments where we find ourselves in um, deep water and we're treading as fast as we can, but with, without a plan, uh, we're, we're ultimately not going to be rescued ashore by anyone until we have those partners in place. Again, power of partnership. So let's go back to what even a crisis comms plan is. What happens when something hits the fan? And it will always. So you've got to be prepared for that, right? So when it does hit, what are your next steps? What do you do? How do you, you take your brand from A to B to C in a really strategic way, but protect your brand at the same time? Maybe protect your business leaders and the thought leadership that you've contributed to your industry at the same time. Reputation management, all of those pieces for startups are really important to think about. Unfortunately, most founders and advisors don't think about that until it's too late. So I would encourage you as you launch your businesses uh, to, uh, to go back to this idea of reputation management, brand management, and ensure that you're focusing some time, energy, and resources on these areas. And finally, the last component that I'll cover today, because we only have an hour together, is the identity piece. Uh, identity becomes something that is recognizable. Uh, some refer to it as logo treatment, right? But it's important to have some brand guidelines and some standards that, that you are able to, um, you know, policy that you are able to put forward. It's also really important that you trademark your brand for so many reasons. We're not going to get into all of them today because of limited time, but I would encourage you to reach out to your attorney who would specialize in that area and he or she will be able to tell you why that's so important. Um, we've gone through that process ourselves for, for our own company. Um, it's not a hard process. It's actually a, a very painless process. So I'm always um, flustered when a client will come to me or a founder who I am supporting in some way and advising will come to me and say, hey, we're getting hit. We're getting hit by this other company. What do we do? And I ask them, have you trademarked your name, your brand, your identity, all of these pieces that are really important to, again, checking back to that reputation management piece that I just mentioned, and they scratch their head and ask, what does that mean? And so in that moment, there's, all, there's obviously education that I have to provide to that founder, but we pull in a partner, right? Again, power of partnership. We might talk to their attorney, or if their attorney isn't uh, really focused on that, then we, we go maybe to Silicon Valley Forum, uh, who might be able to introduce us uh, to, to a couple advisors and attorneys who can. So trademarking is very important. Um, I will also say that it's interesting how many investors uh, in 10 years of coaching founders have asked that as well. They want to see that. Uh, whether or not you're, uh, you're holding a patent for whatever it is that your, your tech uh, brand might be involved in, and patents are awesome as well, but if you're not trademarking your, your, uh, your logo, your identity, and your brand, I think you're missing out on an opportunity here. All right. We're going to stop on the brand conversation for now because we're already at 1030 and we're going to move into PR because I want to leave time for advertising and I want to leave time for your questions. So public relations, uh, the most important thing for all of you to understand, if you take away one thing only from the PR conversation that we're having today, is the fundamental understanding that PR is not a tactic. It is, however, a process. So don't think that your agency deploys public relations on an hourly basis to support your brand. Uh, don't think that your, your um, tactical driven um, you know, conversation that happens with your advisors or 
with your attorney has anything to do with your marketing communications plan or what public relations might actually end up looking uh, like for your brand. PR is a process. You have to respect that process in order to be successful with it. A lot of folks in the tech community continue to refer to ROI. What is ROI? We collectively on a global scale know ROI as return on what? Investment, right? Return on investment means something very specific to us now. We're comfortable with the nomenclature of ROI. We use it in everyday conversation. ROI in public relations means something fundamentally different. ROI means return on involvement. Return on involvement. I want you to understand what involvement actually means to have a successful public relations initiative for your brand. The idea of getting connected to a wider community increases the viability of a lot for your brand, especially in your early days when you're still looking for funding or still looking for board support or hiring the best talent that you can from around the world to support the vision of your newly founded company. What it means to get involved for public relations is surrounding yourself by strategic partners. You, you might understand now where I'm going with this power of partnership idea. Chambers of commerce can be an excellent resource for you. Silicon Valley Forum and organizations like Silicon Valley Forum throughout the world can be an excellent resource to not only share opportunities to connect with the power players of a certain region or industry, but also connect you to investment opportunity. Ultimately, what public relations needs to do is align your message and vision with your business development goals. So public relations can only be successful if your marketing and messaging process lead you to your business development goals. Uh, you know, one of Driven Capital's uh, general partners always says, uh, revenue solves all problems. And I always like that. I always hold on to that when we're coaching startups. Revenue does solve all problems, um, but it's gotta be done in a way that is strategic and still plugged in to your wider community. And if it's not, guess what happens? You miss opportunities for more revenue. You miss opportunities to share your message with a whole host of new audiences that you never even thought your brand might be able to influence and engage with. And you might leave some money on the table too from angels or venture capital. So public relations is a really critical component of what your brand will ultimately do. A few other key areas of public relations that you might already think of when you think of PR, dealing with media, right? Uh, pitching newsworthy content to secure editorial coverage for your brand is really important. But don't just think that because it's news to you that it's going to be news to the reporter. Nine out of 10 times, it's not news. It's really not newsworthy. It might be to you. But when you engage with your advisors or your publicist or whoever you're working with, your people, right, your partners, they might say, no, let's not. Let's wait until we have something even bigger. We don't want to be the boy who cries wolf when it comes to engaging with media. It's not going to help you. We want to set you up for success. So if it's a little story, maybe it's not a press worthy opportunity. Maybe we're going to go pitch it for a human interest piece story instead. Maybe we're going to talk about thought leadership capabilities. What is thought leadership? You as a founder of your brand, you ultimately are going to be positioned to become the thought leader of your company. Okay, great. 
Now, how do we take you to become the thought leader of the industry? Aha, we can only do that with a strategic marketing communications plan. I go back to that first area that we had talked about, right? Again, there's a method to your madness here. There is a method at the end of all of our conversation together this hour. There's a method to even how I'm presenting this content to you today. Do you see how we started with brand? Now we're in public relations, and then we'll get to advertising and digital. You can't start with PR until you've checked the boxes in that brand category, right? Even the content delivered to you in this moment is in a strategic method. I must be in PR. So what else is in that PR bucket? Leadership and executive communication. How does your founder of your company speak? Maybe the leader of your company is not on this call today. Maybe I am talking with the CMO uh, or a board member. How do you get your CEO or your founder to speak the way you want them or need them to speak to sound the way your brand sounds? How do you get her to speak like your brand speaks? That's called executive communication. That's called executive leadership communication. How do you get your CEO to have executive presence so that when she walks in to the boardroom and has the opportunity to shake hands with some prospective investors, she knows that her role in that moment is not to pitch her business, she knows that her role in that moment is to sit down just with the others in that room and let someone else pitch for the business so that she has executive presence and she is seen in a very different way. That's called executive communication opportunities, executive coaching. There's a whole host of opportunities that you can get into as well with your partners like SB Forum or your local chamber of commerce. Strategic partnership initiative is the final piece I'll focus on right now for our PR slide piece. What do I mean by an SPI, a strategic partnership initiative? Okay, let's go back to the idea that a downtown association or a chamber might be supporting your cause, your brand, your ultimate rollout maybe, let's say, of your brand. Well, what does that mean? You're going to pay some you know, annual dues to become a member, and then what? They just disappear, or you expect them to do some heavy lifting for you? Not going to happen. Return on involvement, right? It's got to be more than a check that you write to join something. You've got to roll your sleeves up and figure out who on your team is going to get involved in your community. And in what way? Are you involved in you know, board membership for local nonprofit organizations that ultimately help tell the story of how your brand connects with the community? Maybe. Are you ultimately going to connect with uh, a local business advocacy group uh, to help tell your story, but then what? It's a one-off? No, one-offs don't work. So bake with the right ingredients, a strategic partnership initiative, and take the four or five top organizations or business leaders who you think will become strategic partners of your brand through that marketing communications lens, right? Through that public relations lens. How are they going to become your biggest and boldest and best brand champions, aside from your team, aside from your board? Who are they in your community? You're thinking right now, right? The hamster is on the wheel. I can see the wheel turning in your mind. Now, oh yeah, he's got a good point. Who are my partners? Maybe you don't have any identified yet. Okay, I just gave you some homework for this week. Go and figure out who those partners are and then don't just go to them and ask, hey, what can you do for me? Go to them with a plan. Go to them with an opportunity. I've put a strategic partnership, uh, memorandum together. I put an initiative together for my brand, for my, my business. Here's how I see you, X, Y, or Z organization, becoming part of that. 
And don't forget, there's got to be something in it for them too. That's what partnership is, right? You've got to make sure that it's meaningful and relevant to them as well. It's partnership. Okay. I think I've done what I can in the time given on the public relations piece. And so because of that, I want to move on to advertising, which is the last bucket that we're going to talk about today before I get to some Q&A. Advertising is now known as that paid media bucket, right? If you think of public relations being as earned media, someone is pitching to secure content. Someone is talking with a journalist to encourage them to include you in a quote um, about a story that may not even be about your company, but maybe it's about the industry and you're the thought leader that is now represented in that quote. That's earned media. Now we're gonna talk about paid media, just as important to public relations. However, advertising is also not a tactic. Advertising is a strategic process through which you can see on this deck, educate your audience, increase your revenue and expand what we like to say is goodwill. And we'll talk about that in a minute, what that is. But here's your opportunity to tell your audience who you are, what you do and why you can connect with them in a really interesting way because you control the narrative in advertising you control every single word every single piece of creative every visual component of what you're putting out to the world so it better be the right words it better be the right visuals otherwise you're not doing it the right way right advertising is your opportunity to craft the narrative the way you want now we have what's called sponsored content in a lot of media outlets um, around the world will begin to sell you on the idea of sponsored content. What does that mean? It's sort of advertorial, right? It's sort of where this advertising uh, idea meets editorial, right? And so these two areas come together. Well, what does that marriage look like? The marriage looks like you control the content, you control the narrative, you control the visuals, but it's done in a way where it appears as editorial. It's not. It's, it's not earned media. It's paid media. So you have a responsibility in that moment to showcase your thought leadership, but not shove your brand down the throats of people who will ultimately engage with this, right? It's done in a softer way. It's done in a really meaningful way. It's also likely done in a way where you can showcase your leader or, or leaders of your brand in a way that says, we know our market better than anyone else and here's how and here's why, right? So advertising takes on many forms. Obviously everything in the digital space, we look at from social to uh, skyscraper jumbo ads in newsletters and everything on on websites that are are promoting your brand. Uh, we're looking at perhaps dedicated e blasts that are aligned with the vision and goals. For example, as your startup continues to look for investment, where might you identify a media partner? for a targeted email distribution. Well, you might look at a partner like the Silicon Valley Business Journal or the Los Angeles Business Journal that works uh, to serve the needs of business influencers in those regions. What does it look like when you open that dedicated email? It looks like you're getting an email from the Business Journal. You are, but guess what? Your open rate is going to be through the roof. Why? Because the journal is a respected brand that already has the respect of the person who is opening it. And so they're opening it because you've identified the journal as a strategic advertising, what? Partner. You're paying them, but they become a partner for your brand. Really important to think about this in the right way. They're not a vendor. 
Remove the word vendor right now from your vocabulary. Don't use it in emails. Don't use it in conversation orally. It's not a word that should ever be used in our society. It's a dirty word, vendor. It means I'm going to do something for you, and that's it. There's just simply a business transaction. I don't look for vendors. I look for partners. My attorney, my financial planner, my bank, um, my advisors who help me get to where I am, those are partners, not vendors, right? Your photographer, your videographer, right? All, they need to be seen and thought of as a real partner. And if they don't understand your business, and if they're not taking the time to understand your business and how the work that they do can ultimately influence your revenue, say it's been real, but I'm going to go look for a partner who wants my business because they understand my business and they want to help my business thrive. That's the real difference between a vendor and a partner. All right, I think I've done all I can with the advertising space again in the time that we have today. So I want to get to our conversation and I see some Q&A and some chat uh, picking up here. So please uh, include your questions um, at this point. Someone is talking about um, how, you know, it'll be helpful for early stage startups to know um, how they maximize their marketing and branding with minimal resources. It's a, it's a great question. Yeah, de depends on how early stage uh, that company is. If you've got some funding, um, then you, you've got an opportunity um, to, to commit some of those dollars to that, that specific piece. In fact, a lot of investors will want to see some of your dollars go to specific marketing um, and communications opportunities. They will say, you know, th don't forget that uh, a critical component of becoming successful is that marketing piece. Okay, if you don't have funding or if you're bootstrapping something, how do you do it? You did it the way I did it when I started my business over a decade ago. You bootstrap it through partnership. You look for opportunities to engage in your larger community who can actually benefit your brand in a way that is really strategic. What do I mean by that? When I started my business, um, I didn't have funding. I bootstrapped it myself. Um, most agencies do that, right? Uh, marketing, advertising, public relations agencies. We're not in the tech space, right? We're not the, we're not the, the next tech darling uh, unicorn who is going to attract investment. So when I did that, I got involved in my community. I got involved in community service organizations that would allow me to network with the real influencers and power players uh, within multiple industries not for the reason of generating business ever. And I want, to, I want to mention that again. That's a really important comment. Don't go into something with the sole purpose of selling your brand to them because you're going to fail. Go into something, get involved in your community, go join a board or a committee, go speak to your local whomever, you know, um, or go just show up to these next events that will happen and be ready to put your hand out and, and get to know people. But don't do it with the sole purpose of revenue. Go into it with the sole purpose of partnership. And guess what? Business will come. It does. Because when you create and craft and collaborate, with people with the sole interest of getting to know them and getting to understand their business and becoming perhaps even a referral resource to them, they will start sending you business. They themselves might become a client. So I would say if you have minimal investment, return on involvement. Don't think return on investment. You don't have investment yet. So get involved and watch the magic start to happen. But don't get involved until you've done these other pieces first in that brand bucket. Marketing communications plan, brand promise, figure out what your messaging needs to be so that when you put your hand out, 
to shake this, the powerful CEO's hand at the, you know, the barbecue event in your community or whatever it is, that you understand how to communicate to that powerful CEO and that she understands very quickly and efficiently who you are and what you do. Involvement is the key to success without early investment. Someone has a question. I hope I, hope I answered that question for that person. Someone has a question now. Uh, do you think that before hiring a marketing agency type partner, good, they thought of partner, there should be an in-house marketing team which will be more appropriate in leading the vision of the company, uh, for example, an early stage startup. We get this question all the time. Th thank you uh, uh, to the person who asked this. I, I love this question. Um, there is no one size fits all approach to the answer that I will give. Sometimes having an in-house marketing team um, is great if you've got some level of, um, of thinking holistically. But if that marketing team is simply taking direction from the leadership, you're probably already stunting your growth in a way that you're leaving dollars on the table or you know, you're not gonna be able to communicate efficiently or effectively as much as you could had you brought in an external partner for a lot of reasons. And I'll, I'll cover just a couple really quickly. First, I see your brand really differently than you ever will or ever could. That's not a knock at a founder. That's not a knock at a CMO. It's just a fact. I see a brand differently than someone who is being um, forced to see that brand daily from within, right? I see my own brand in a really different way than others see my own brand, right? It's just the fact, right? So as an external partner, whether it's an agency partner, whether it's an attorney or a financial advisor or a, a general partner at a venture capital fund giving you advice, listen and learn from those people because they see your brand in a different way. They've been there before, right? This is that return on involvement idea as well. Those people can become real partners if you listen and learn. So I don't say that there is a one size fits all approach. I will say this, don't wait too long to bring in an outside partner. A lot of startups say that we can tackle this from within and they go to market. Okay, they've got their go to market strategy. They've got their slide deck. They've got it all ready to go. And then when an agency partner comes in, they might say, well, the language you're using doesn't work for the market that you're trying to target. Or the language or visuals that you're using don't reflect the diversity of thought that journalists want to see and need to see and nowadays must see in order for our team to be able to secure editorial coverage for your brand, right? Those are the types of conversations. Or your attorney might come in and say, who told you this was okay to put out, right? And, you know, and she might say, this is a very dated way of doing this. We really need to surround you by best in class professionals uh, versus trying to do this from within. I think corporate counsel in-house can be really successful when you're not in the early stage. When you are in a much later stage with a different series of funding and you've got some revenue generating, I think those are great things. But I would really look at bringing partners in early. Don't wait too late. Know us before you need us. There's another partner, uh, another uh, full, someone else on this, Marianne uh, is, is saying, is asking how important is it to change your brand from the early days um, bootstrapping to improve the look of the branding for some capital investment. So if I understand this, um, Marianne, I'm sorry if I botched that, but if I'm understanding your question correctly, you're asking, is it important or how important is it to not maybe go through a complete rebrand of what, of how you started um, when you bootstrapped it to now 
where you are to attract investment, whatever level investment that might be. Might be angels, might be VC, might be something else. Okay, that's a really good question. Um, my answer is I've got to see it first, right? I don't know how to answer that until I can engage with your brand. Um, I will say this, over 60% of founders and startups who have come to us in the past 10 years, over 60%, that's a big number. We have strategically recommended that there is some level of brand pivot. We would never suggest that unless we really thought it would be strategic and meaningful and important and going to you know, lead to other opportunities down the road. You don't want your brand uh, to, uh, you, you don't want your brand to be too Mickey Mouse, right? Um, you, you want it to be at a level that is, um, that commands respect. Uh, and if your brand can't command respect, guess what happens? Your agency partner can't pitch for real content because journalists only see this brand as something that was started maybe six years ago and is at zero revenue and zero clients, right? And so maybe there is a brand pivot there. Um, the other really big component of a brand pivot, I don't, I don't say rebrand. Rebrand re is a is a is a word, is a is a phrase that is is grossly overused, and people don't really understand what it is. Uh, a brand pivot is probably what you're looking at. Um, but if you don't take that brand pivot and you're still living in, you know, 2008 when you started, the other thing that you're that can't be ultimately as successful as I would like to see is that your leader, your CEO, or your founder cannot be as successful as she might be able to become should your brand take on some new energy. You know, much like people, brands have energy. And it's really important that we encourage founders, advisors, CMOs from within to understand that there is an energy. And that goes back to brand promise as well, that very first thing that we had talked about. I hope I answered your question, Marianne, as well. Um, I think that we have to stop here because we're at 11. Um, and I am sorry that I probably wasn't able to get to all of your questions. Um, but Denise and the good folks um, at uh, Silicon Valley Forum have my contact information. And um, I'd be happy to connect with, with you on LinkedIn and have conversations uh, that we can continue at a later time. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over uh, back to you, Denise. And uh, once again, thank you for allowing me to, to have the floor today. I hope you learned something today. What a great presentation, Nicholas. Honestly, um, I have some homework to do here. <laughs> um, like you, um, Silicon Valley Forum has long believed in the transformative power of partnerships. So that really resonates, you know, with what you said and really in everything we do, we do here. So thank you for all your, um, for participating today and all the great information that you imparted. Um, if anybody, we will also be sending out the slide deck um, presented by Nicholas today to all the participants here as well as a copy of the recording. So thank you to everyone who joined us. We appreciate your time. Um, thank you for the wonderful folks at Hopkins and Carly for your wonderful partnership. And just hope everybody has a um, great rest of the day and a phenomenal weekend. So thank you so much. Bye. Thanks, Denise.